<clears throat> With that, I'd like to switch gears. We'll transition um, to talking about the origins of HIV. How did the virus make it into humans? So we have HIV zoo noses, right? Is that how you would say that? Anybody disagree? It's not what it says. It's not zoo noses, although I prefer that pronunciation myself. It's HIV zoonoses, and that's plural for zoonosis. That's when a disease goes from an animal into a human. This has happened more than once. We'll discover that in a moment. But what I'd like to discuss with you are the who, the what, the where, the when, and the how HIV has made it into humans. So the who and what. I'll start with the simple version. You have a red cap manga bee and you have a greater spot nose monkey. And each of them is infected with their own virus. Simian immunodeficiency virus, RCM, or Simian immunodeficiency virus, GSN. Okay? Well, as chimpanzees are prone to do, chimps like to eat monkeys. It's probably not the most sanitary of processes when that happens. Blood can be passed back and forth between these animals during that process. And it turns out that somewhere, somehow, a chimpanzee had both the GSN and the RCM virus in its body, and those viruses recombined into a new virus that became SIV CPZ for chimpanzee. And then at some point, the virus then transitioned into humans, probably through a similar mechanism. We'll discuss that through bushmeat, et cetera. But the story actually is more complicated than, than that simple illustration makes it. In fact, you have the process that was just described generating HIV here, HIV-1, but the label there says HIV-1 group M and group N and possibly group O. So just the fact that it has M and N, that tells you already that's happened at least twice. Furthermore, a lot of different monkeys have their own SIVs. Could those also jump into the human population? Well, the answer is yes. HIV-2 is a direct transmission from sooty mangabees into humans. Furthermore, <coughs> SIV-CPZ has transitioned through gorillas to be group P and possibly group O. It's not quite settled at this point. So what that means is there's been at least five separate zoonoses to generate HIV. There's HIV-1, group M, group N, group O, group P, and HIV-2. But as it turns out, HIV group M is the virus that's most responsible for the global uh, pandemic that we're experiencing. And group M is composed of subtypes, flavors, clades. Group M has A, B, C, D, F, G, and so forth. Plus, there are circulating recombinant forms of combinations of A and E, for example, that are in the populations. <clears throat> and they're spread all over the world. But the viruses that are spread around the world are not uniformly spread according to the, um, the intensity of people who are infected. So most people are infected in Sub-Saharan Africa and Southeast Asia and groups uh, clade C is one of the most prevalent of the viruses in these regions. But in the more resource rich countries of the world, group B is the subtype that's prevalent. So most HIV research to date has focused on group B, even though the majority of people who are infected are infected with something other than B. Um, here in Skyboo, we make efforts to incorporate in our trials individuals who are um, not group B or subtype B, but the majority of our patients are, and, and to the extent that we can, we try to expand what we can do. <clears throat> Where did this happen? It happened in Africa. Uh, just to, to orient you to the map that's here in the color scheme, you have four different subspecies of chimpanzee, pan troglodytes, as well as bonobos, which are very closely related to chimpanzees. Uh, they're on the south side of the Congo River. And you have the chimps in these different regions. 
Now I had mentioned that HIV-2 came straight from sooty mangabees. That happened up in this part of Africa. And that's why the chimps at the field stations here were not positive for SIV because there wasn't an intermediate in SIV, uh, chimpanzees. Here is where group M is found, uh, the precursor to group M in the wild chimp populations. And this is uh, where Jane Goodall's research areas are located and, and they're some of the field stations that were used in this research. So you have um, no SIV in the bonobos and then you have in the pan troglodytes, troglodytes, the group M, and then in the pan troglodytes, swan furthia, you have other um, SIV CPZs have been identified. So just a quick question. How do you think they were able to survey wild chimps for SIV? Any ideas? Anybody want to hazard a guess? Yes, ma'am? Chasing poop? They, they picked up their poop out of the woods. And then they uh, developed assays. Uh, uh, Beatrice Hahn, among others, was able to develop assays where they could look into the feces of these animals for nucleic acid and actually sequence the virus out of the feces. But in addition to the feces, they also were able to look in urine and look for the presence of antibodies against the virus in urine. Now, how do you suppose you collect urine from a wild chimp? You, well, what do you do the first thing you get up in the morning? Where do you go? I'm guessing you go to the same place I go, or at least where the equivalent facility in your <laughs> living uh, quarters. So you, you go to, to the bathroom, right? Well, chimps do the same thing. So what these researchers do is they figure where the chimps are sleeping. They make their beds at night, put their little sticks up, and they go to where the chimps are sleeping, and they stand with this upside-down umbrella, it makes a funnel and they just wait and they collect the urine as it comes down and then they do their test. And between these two sets of analyses, they've been able to do some very extensive, very elaborate uh, studies which have allowed me to tell you what I just told you about how the virus came into humans. But also with those genetics, you can learn something about the human, uh, the timing of when uh, this occurred. So there's a city called Kinshasa, which is very difficult for me to say, I apologize. Uh, you have Kinshasa right there on the Congo River and there's uh, material from an individual who died in 19, or the, the material is from 1959 and this is the first material where HIV has been identified in the human population. So we have verified HIV infection in 1959 in Kinshasa. So what is Kinshasa? It's a colonial town. It was established around 1880, as were several other colonial towns established in the early 1900s, and by 1959 had a couple hundred thousand people living there. Well, it turns out that in addition to this 1959 material, there is 1960 material also from a second individual. And through genetic analysis, comparing the genetics of the 1959 virus and the 1960 virus, it's possible to backtrack to what's referred to as the most common recent, or the most recent common ancestor between these viruses and get an estimation of when the virus must have been in humans in order to have diverged that much by 1959 and 60. And the conclusion from this study is that the genetic diversity between the 59 and the 60 virus indicates that the virus had been circulating for years and possibly even decades in this population before the uh, samples were collected. And that's what this gray line is. So somewhere between 1885 and 1925, it's estimated that HIV had, the group M had entered into the human population to generate the viruses that we're seeing here. How did this happen? We don't know. We weren't there. But we can speculate, much like I speculated a moment ago with uh, the chimpanzees killing and eating each other. In this part of the world, bushmeat is a major commodity. And you don't wear personal protective equipment generally when you're processing bushmeat. You don't see gloves on these hands. 
and it doesn't take much of an imagination to imagine how you could get a scratch from a bone or your knife as you're in the process and have a blood transfer. And, and it's presumed that something analogous to this is what happened when the transmission came from chimps to humans.